afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Prasanna. Uh, I'm a faculty in the EE program here at Tech, and I'll be moderating uh, this subgroup of the senior design today. Can you all hear me? Hear you, hear you yes, really? sir. All right, thank you. Um, so first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, to these presentations. Um, you know, I'd like to welcome some of our faculty members, some of the advisory board members, some of our alumni, students, you know, junior classmen, um, and friends and family of everyone. <clears throat> We're glad to have everyone here. And all of our students have put a lot of effort into these projects over the past few year, uh, past year, and especially in the last few months where they had to you know, juggle multiple ball, balls at the same time. So they've all done a great job. So we really appreciate everyone being here. And then, you know, uh, you know, we can say how much we appreciate all the work the students have done. So <clears throat> one of the things, like unlike a regular presentation where we could easily ask questions, um, I think what we can try doing this time is um, we'll, if you have some questions while the presentations are going on, it would be best if you could send the question to me on the, using the chat window, and then I'll ask these to the students in a timely manner. But that being said, while, uh, you know, the time slot for each group's presentation is 30 minutes, but the, we'll make sure that the presentations only last about 20 minutes. So after the last 10 minutes of each group's presentation, we'll have, you know, have time allocated for question answers and some demonstrations. So, uh, you know, if you think your questions can wait, you know, you may also wait until then. Or if it's something that you want to get answered immediately, you know, feel free to uh, text me on that uh, chat window. And after all the pre or each of the presentations are, are done, <coughs> um, we'll have a or I'll have a link posted on the chat window that you can use to, uh, it, it'll be a survey on, uh, so that you can rate how you like the presentations. Wait, I, I'm, I, can, I can actually put it up right now. So once the presentations are done, everyone. So you should uh, have seen this, uh, this link on SurveyMonkey. So once you once the presentation are done, please uh, take a few minutes to go to that link and then fill it uh, as you see fit. <clears throat> that being said, um, um, I think we're about it's 2 p.m. and our first group is ready. So at this time, I'm going to uh, let our first group uh, take over the presentations and then hope you all enjoy it. <clears throat> All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. Yes. Yes. Sir. All right. Good afternoon, Dr. Batari. Good afternoon, everybody else. Uh, I am Jared Martintel, and today we'll be me and the team will be demonstrating our guitar amplifier. Our team is composed of David Newsbaum, Aiden Fitzgerald, myself, and Chris Peltzer. So our specific aim for making this guitar amplifier was to make a small, simple, lightweight guitar amplifier that could be uh, prefabricated or sold as a do-it-yourself kit. Uh, we were then going to compare it to the Frontman Fender G or 15G. Uh, Aiden Fitzgerald has one of those, so we thought we could compare it uh, against that. The Frontman is a little more extensive than what we were trying to do, but we figured that it was a close fit that we could compare it to. Our goal was to have the amplifier under three pounds and around $70. And also the circuit design was supposed to be simple in design. The end result was that we came up with two different designs for the guitar amplifier, the one amp design, which uh, has a volume control, a gain control, and a tone control. The speaker size was about six and a half inches, weighed about eight and a half pounds, and the price came out to $71. And then the Ruby design was our second design, which only had volume and gain control, no tone control. Speaker was much smaller, and the weight was much smaller. And the price came in about 70, or uh, I'm, excuse me, $36. We chose the, our, uh, the LM386 to be our operational amplifier. 
Um, as we looked around the internet and searched out different things, we fit, figured that this would be one of the best fits. Um, it's really easy to use. It has a low operating voltage, so we weren't limited to just a wall plug. Uh, we could use batteries if we needed to, which was incorporated in our design. So a nine volt battery, it'll run off of that. Um, few components are needed to actually make it work. Uh, there's an ability for gain control and boost control. Um, the gain control comes off of the pins one and eight uh, and has a gain from 20 to 200. The, the normal gain is just 20, but with this gain control, we can crank it up to 200. There's also a base boost control on pins one and five. We, however, didn't use this one um, because we do have a tone control before the amplifier, which took care of some of that base quality, uh, so we didn't use that. Um, there's a bypass at pin seven, which we can use. And then just the amount of information on the LM386 was extensive. So we had a lot of stuff we could look at, a lot of other resources and information. Uh, the picture off to the right left corner is the total harmonic distortion. So it's the lowest around the frequencies that we're actually going to be playing, such as guitar, vocal, and music, uh, which was what we were looking for, the least amount of distortion for what we we're going to play. Here's the schematic for the one amp design that we had. It's basically composed of four stages. The first stage, is, stage being the JFET input stage, where the signal is increased. Then we come to our tone control, which is composed of two uh, uh, bypass filters. One is a little bit higher, one is a little bit lower, and then depending on where our potentiometer is at, it'll either give us the higher tones or lower tones, depending on the potentiometer. Next stage is another JFET booster. Uh, this boosts the signal one last time before we come to the LM386 power stage. And then out on the right side, pin five goes directly to the speaker. We did add a few uh, modifications to this circuit. We placed the 100 microfarad uh, capacitor between the positive and negative terminals for the power supply. Uh, we were hearing some noise, some static noise, uh, just a clean version. So we popped that in there, took care of some of the noise for us. Also a 10K resistor on pin seven helped take care of some of the noise. And then depending on which one we used, either a 220 microfarad capacitor or a 470 microfarad capacitor was used right before the speaker. Uh, without this, it was a little bit grainy. Um, so we were trying to minimize our noise and get a cleaner sound and using one of these two, either one, uh, will clean up the sound a little bit better. Here's a, uh, two pictures of the one amp design. On the left is our open, open box. We've got the circuit design there at the bottom. The battery pack is being used. Um, it's designed where we can either use a wall mount or a battery pack, either or. And then the picture to the right is the actual enclosed case. All right, um, I want to talk about the test results we were able to get for the one amp design before the coronavirus hit. So right here is the JFoot input stage of our one amp design where we'll be looking at the test point two. On the left, uh, we have the JFoot input stage oscilloscope ring that was expected based on the one amp website. And on the right is what we got for our design. I would like to note that the blue, that our, our graph is flipped compared to theirs, where the blue line represents the test point two, and our yellow line represents the guitar input. And as you can see right here, we are getting less than what they got because we have used a different um, JFET than what they used in the original design, where we're using a MPF 102. And now we're going on to tone control, where, we're, where we use the first pot. So right, right here on the left is the tone control that was expected from the one way up website. And on the right is our tone control at low resistance where we're getting a bit less than what they expected. But when we go to high resistance, as you can see, we're getting much more than what they expected to get. Now we're going on to the power amplification stage which is separated into fine control and gain control where I would like to mention that um, in the original design, uh, we, we were wanting to add, it, add headphones and line out, but because of the coronavirus, we weren't able to implement these into our design. So the only thing we have is our speaker. So going on, 
we have the expected volume control results on the left from the OneWet website. And on the right is our silica breeding for the volume control when the volume is off, where as you expect, we have a straight line. And then when we go on to the medium volume for the volume control, we're getting a, a less than what they expected. But when we go to high volume, we get much more than what they expected to get for volume control. And then when we go to gain control, we are, we're comparing our low gain to their low gain, where at their low gain, they got 7.6 peak to peak voltage. And at our low gain, we got 7.2 peak to peak voltage. But that, but at high gain, where it starts to clip, they only got around eight peak to peak voltage. And we actually got 11.4, which is more than what they got. And from these salts, we can see from the amplifier gain that it came out to be around 35 at the minimum and around 60 at max. For frequency response to the oscilloscope, we can see that the frequencies were in phase. And for the signal to noise ratio, even though we didn't quite get a definite number, through observing the signals to the oscilloscopes, it could be seen that there was barely any noise during our process. And we were able to form a decibel test, which was where we used a Pixel 3 smartphone two feet away from the amplifier where we had a max dB without gain from around 88 to 95 dB. And then we had a max dB with max gain at 90 to 95 dB. All right, so I'm gonna cover some of the measures that we took for the coronavirus. Um, as soon as things started happening, we decided we needed a contingency plan uh, what this was is we decided that we were going to do a uh, design based around our original one WAMP, but a simpler version that would re require fewer components and be easier to build. It's still based around the LM386, but it only has one JFET input stage instead of two. Uh, some of the modifications we made is uh, we boosted the power from 9 to 12 volts. And we also used a higher strength input buffer cap because uh, uh, after testing, this had better noise filtering. And here's our schematic. And as you can see, uh, the only things we changed from the original Ruby were the 12 volt uh, upgrade and the increased input buffer from the power supply up to 200 microfarads. So this is our parts list for the Ruby. Um, we were pretty happy with this. Uh, we were able to bring it down to just under $36. And that is uh, well below our goal. On the left here, you see the interior of the case. It's a fairly simple circuit. And on the right, you can see the closed case. It has a volume control, gain control, and an off and on switch. So we weren't able to get as much data on the Ruby because it was built after campus was closed. But we did find uh, using our phone decibel test, we got 106 decibels before the quality deteriorated. And waveform testing was carried out using an oscilloscope emulator on PC. So here you see the results at 200 hertz and the waveforms closely match. So we were happy with that. At 400 hertz, it's not quite as clean, but we felt this was still pretty close. And lastly, at 1000 hertz, kind of our upper range, uh, we felt this was a pretty good match as well. Again, all these results are a bit questionable because they were not carried out with a real oscilloscope, but this was the best we could do under the circumstances. So now I'm going to talk to you guys about the spectrum analysis that we conducted. The equipment I used was a software called Reason, which is a digital audio workstation, a CAD audio D90 microphone, which is what I'm speaking to you now on and the following website to generate the baseline sine waves at various frequencies. Uh, through the fender and the one lamp, I swept from a frequency of 20 
to 19k hertz and tested the tone and gain controls from 3.708, 440, into 349.318 hertz. For reference, if you're curious, those are like 3.708 is roughly D1 or 2, really low D on a piano. So as you can see right here, this is what the right, this is what the tone knob does if turned all the way to the right. It acts as a low pass filter. As such, the low frequencies are much more enhanced. And then if we do the opposite, conversely, we have the high pass filter action where we turn the knob all the way to the left. This causes the low frequencies to go down. And then just to illustrate how the gain uh, reacts at lower frequencies, it gets very muddy, it's very dirty, lots and lots of clashing harmonics, as you can see on the spectrum analysis. Not that this is really in the guitar range, but still interesting to note. Uh, 440 is a standard A that everyone tunes to. Uh, since this is in the middle frequency, the, um, the filter will kind of act very similarly because they're not really, this tone isn't really high or low, but nonetheless, when we do the high, the low pass filter action, it still slightly boosts the signal. As well as converse, when we do the high pass filter, this, a similar thing occurs. Uh, the gain test, because we're starting to move into the higher frequencies where we don't have as much uh, harmonic information to clip, so to speak, uh, there's not as much clipping, but there is still, it's still there and it is getting a dirtier sound at this range. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, this is D7, if I remember correctly. It's a very high D tone on a piano. Um, this is really starting to head outside of the guitar range, but still is interesting to see how the amp reacts. So when the low pass filter is uh, used on it, this causes the high frequencies to lower. And conversely, when we use the high pass filter, this causes the high frequencies to go up. And then the low end response, as I mentioned before, this is kind of out. This is outside the guitar's range. However, at lower, really low frequencies, it's uh, a little dirty. It's not quite as clean. How it's as mentioned earlier, not in the guitar range, but still interesting to note. Um, compared to the Fender, this is more in the guitar range. Um, they're pretty similar. There's um, the noise that you see on the Fender is more background noise, but nonetheless, they, repro they reproduce the mids fairly similarly. Uh, in the mid-high, um, the Fender's may be a little more uniform, whereas our amp was a bit, has some of that choppiness on the upper frequency peaks, but otherwise fairly similar. Um, I performed very similar tests uh, with the Ruby amp to be socially distant and safe. Um, David would record the various tests I need needed from him on his phone and then would send me the MP3s to analyze through the software. So as compared to the Fender, the Ruby has a lot more um, of these other harmonics added in. Kind of adds, depending upon what guitar you're using, could be adding a more rich tone. It depends on what your hookup is. Um, a similar response at the mid-range, not much uh, to really report on. They're pretty similar. Again, more rich harmonics depending upon what your setup is. At the upper end, it's pretty much almost exactly the same. Uh, the Ruby has a few more uh, peaks at that very top end, but we're kind of getting out to the guitar range, so it wouldn't be very applicable. The, the gain testing, so this is right in the middle, mid-range. Um, it behaves as expected as you slowly crank the gain. It becomes more and more distorted before fully clipping out um, and figure 65. And then here, you know, as we get higher, we kind of notice the gain starts to clip maybe a little sooner before you hit max gain, as you can see in figure 68. And then at the very top end has very similar results. 
before we hit max gain, we're already getting some pretty strong clipping um, at this frequency range. Um, so as I mentioned before, we had, uh, we had the COVID-19 pandemic hit us. And as such, these were the tests we were sadly unable to perform for you. So that's the total harmonic distortion, the fast Fourier transform distortion spectrum, and the intermodulation distortion. All of these were tests we wish to perform, but were unable to. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn back to David for the Ruby demonstration. All right, so I'm going to start at the low gain. So that's going to be our uh, minimal distortion. to the mid gain region. And then uh, I will demonstrate the one wimp. Uh, first, I'll just show you that it is physically next to me, the knobs move and all that. So here's that. And then next, I'm going to demonstrate the uh, tone control. I'll start at the low end, boosting the bass signals, go mid, and then go high. All right, give me a sec, I'll fix that.
And now I'll quickly demonstrate the, uh, the gain function and then we can move on to questions. So yeah, that demonstrates all the functions of the AMP. And if uh, nobody else has anything else, are there any questions? Um, as we mentioned before, we built, we built two prototypes, even despite the COVID and everything, we built two functioning prototypes um, and achieved a, more, than, more than we thought we were with all the crisis going on. So again, any questions? Thank you guys for a very good presentation and uh, uh, project. So right now, uh, at this moment, uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions. And if you're unable to unmute yourself, let me know. I think everyone should be able to do it. Um, I see in the chat that um, Nick Collin has asked a question for the oscilloscope results. Yeah, if you got the question, I feel, please feel free to answer it. Which is that the real oscilloscope or the emulator? Uh, curious when he was going through it earlier, the, the oscope results. Uh, I think uh, the professor answered it was uh, against the op amp results from the website from the manufacturer. Yes, that is correct. It is against the manufacturer's results. Going once, going twice. Y'all mentioned y'all had some, uh, y'all used a digital analyzer there for, for the second portion of the project, basically when y'all were quarantined. Uh, what were some of the, I guess, oddities that y'all discovered when you're using the digital version versus the real oscope uh, makes it stand apart? So that would be David. David did all that. Yes. Uh, so. As I said, I found the emulator online, which was very helpful. Um, and on those slides on the left, it would basically play the expected waveform for the frequency. Um, but I kind of questioned how accurately it was able to uh, pick up my amps because I had to use an auxiliary cord extension to hook it into my computer so it would be able to hear it. And so I uh, wasn't incredibly confident with those results. So I would say that was the uh, biggest difficulty. And also just finding an emulator to begin with was not easy. Well, I guess if nobody else has any other questions, then um, I guess we're good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for a great presentation, guys. And everyone in the audience, I request everyone if they could take a second to fill out the survey that's on the uh, 
chat window. We really appreciate it. Uh, and while everyone is filling out the evaluations, uh, Andrew, Jeremy, Taylor, and Tristan, I've made you guys co-hosts, so you should be ready to, or you should be able to share your screen now. So I guess you can uh, bring up the presentation and when everyone is ready, we'll get you guys started. Dr. Batari, I think our group was uh, supposed to go next. Uh, I believe we're at 3.30. Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 I'm sorry about that. That was what I had scheduled as well, Right, you guys should be able to share the screen. All right, I think you guys should be ready to start now. We should be good to go. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Samuel Pepper. And I'm Martin Mendiola. And I'm Nicholas Johnson. And our project is three-phase power factor metering and correction. Here's what we'll cover today in this presentation. The specific aims of the project, which is to improve the electrical efficiency of a system by correcting the power factor. The scope of our design was to prove that we could use a basic microcontroller to correct the power factor of a system. Our engineering approach of how we work through the project will be explained in the later slides and the cost analysis showing the breakdown that we're spending given our budget. So 
So the general problem that our project addresses is the low power factor of a three-phase system caused by inductive loads. The power factor of a system is determined by the phase shift between voltage and current that is drawn by the load and is a direct reflection of the efficiency of the system. Power factor can range from zero to one and is typically considered low when it falls below 0 0.9. For utility providers, when power factor for utility providers, power factor provides insight into a customer's power consumption habits. When a customer's power factor falls below a certain value, often 0 0.9, utility providers apply fees because the low power factor increases current draw and causes voltage drops, which reduces the distribution capacity. These added fees can become very costly for industrial customers However, they can easily be avoided by increasing the power factor of their facility. The purpose of our project is to create a device capable of monitoring and correcting the power factor of an electrical system, which will help to improve the efficiency. When we began our project, some of the initial questions that we set out to answer were to determine if we could accurately measure power factor using a simple microcontroller and to evaluate the effectiveness of using capacitors to correct the power factor of varying loads. To answer these questions, we began by constructing circuits that would allow us to measure the voltage, current, and power factor using an Arduino Uno microcontroller. Next, we wrote a program for the Arduino that would allow it to calculate the capacitance needed to correct the power factor of the load and then introduce that capacitance into the system via a switchable capacitor bank. In order for our design to function as intended, we determined that it must be capable of performing multiple operations. Our design is separated into five modules that each perform a separate task. The major modules of our design include a voltage measurement circuit, a current measurement circuit, a power factor measurement circuit, a switchable capacitor bank, and an Arduino microcontroller. I will now hand it over to Martin and he will explain some of our measure measurement circuits. So this slide shows our voltage measurement circuit and in order for the microcontroller to be able to measure the 240 volt system, we designed, we designed the circuit to be able to take in an input of 240 volts and output a signal that is between zero to five volts that is within the readable range of the Arduino Uno. The voltage measurement circuit consists of a Y connected resistive circuit that is used to create a neutral point and to get a 240 volt line to line to 134 volts line to neutral. We then uh, use the voltage transformer to step down the line to neutral system voltage from 134 volts to approximately eight volts. And then we used a resistive divider to step down the voltage even further to have a peak amplitude of approximately one and a half volts. Next, the two and a half DC voltage offset is then applied to shift the sinusoidal voltage signal into the positive region. And the final output of our voltage measurement circuit is a sinusoidal voltage uh, with a range of zero to five volts, which can be read by the microcontroller. Uh, to measure the current supplied to the load, we constructed a current measurement circuit that operates similarly to the voltage measurement circuit. And the current measurement circuit consists of a current transformer that steps down the load current with a ratio of 1,000 to 1. We then use a 65 ohm burden resistor to produce a voltage signal that is proportional to the line current. And we chose the 65 ohm resistor because it limits the voltage between 0 to 5 volts. And once again, a two and a half volt DC offset is used to shift the signal completely above the zero axis. And the final output of the current measurement circuit is a signal proportional to the actual line current, but within the zero to five volt range. During our design process, we decided that the most accurate way to measure power factor using our Arduino microcontroller was to design the zero crossing comparator circuit. This circuit consists of two op amps and an XOR gate. One op amp inputs a voltage signal from a voltage transformer 
and the other inputs a current signal from a current transformer. The outputs of each op amp are square waves that have equal amplitude and pulse width of their respective sinusoidal inputs. The op amp outputs are then fed into an XOR gate, which produces a positive DC pulse that is equal in duration to the time difference between the voltage and current signal. The Arduino microcontroller then measures the duration of this differential time signal and uses it to calculate the phase angle between the voltage and current. As a visual representation of the operation of our power factor measurement circuit, we have some waveforms shown that are generated that were generated by simulating the circuit. In the top graph, you can see the sinusoidal voltage and current signals that are inputs into the op amps. The middle graph shows the outputs of each op amp. As you can see, the outputs are square waves that alternate relative to their respective inputs. And lastly, the output of the XOR gate is shown in the bottom graph. The pulse width of this signal is equal to the time difference between the zero crossings of the two input signals. After we constructed the measurement part of our project, we want to test the accuracy of the measuring circuits we have constructed using the Power Lab on campus. To do this, we used a 10 horsepower, 240 volt induction motor, and we coupled it to a dynamometer, which allowed us to vary the load on the motor. As you can see from the two graphs here, we measured the voltage RMS, current RMS, apparent power, real power, and power factor from 20 to 100 percent full rate of load in 20 percent increments. For this test, we used the power meter or BMI in, their, in the power lab as our control. Its measurements are in the table above and compared it to our project in the table below. From the data in the charts above, we found that, the, we found that our project was accurate within 1% of the power meter in the lab, showing that our measuring circuits are accurate. Uh, to determine the capacitance values, that we need to that we need to correct that we need to correct the power factor to 0.95. We use the data from the power factor measuring test in the slide above. First, we cal calculate the reactive power drawn by the load at each of the load steps by using the power triangle. We do this by taking the square root of the apparent power squared minus real power squared. Then we found the reactive power that sh what the reactor power should be to make the power factor of the load 0.95, which we call the target reactive power by using the power triangle again, but having the power factor equal to 0.95 instead of the measured value. Finally, we calculate the capacitance needed per a delta branch of a capacitor bank by using the, by using the formula of one over six pi omega C. This would bring the reactive power to the target reactive value and make the power factor of the system 0.95. For the power factor correction portion of our project, we chose to construct a three-stage capacitor bank with delta connected capacitors, as you can see in the slide here. Based on the calculations from the previous slide, the capacitors that, we were, that were within our budget and we bought were the, were the stage one 27.4 microfarad capacitors that will supply 1.76 kVar, the 41.1 microfarad capacitors that will supply 2.65 kVar, and the third stage, which was a 46 microfarad capacitor that will supply 2.96 kVar. For the purpose of this project, though, we'll be combining the stages cor to correct the power factor of the system. The stages that we'll be combining will be the first and second stage to get the KVOR of 4.41 and capacitance of 68.5 microfarads, 1 and 3 to get a KVOR of 4.72 and a capacitance of 73.4 microfarads, and two and three to get a KVOR of 5.61 and a capacitance of 87.3. Each of the capacitors we bought are equipped with the bleeder resistors to slowly dissipate the 
residual charge after the capacitors are removed from the circuit. In order for the Arduino microcontroller to be able to switch capacitors into or out of the system, we designed a cascading switching network that consists of a BJT, a relay, and a contactor. The BJT is connected to the Arduino digital output that outputs a max of 200 or 20 milliamps and controls the 12 volt supply from our battery packs to the coil of the relay. The relay then controls the 134 volt supply from our line to neutral circuit that goes to the coil of our contactor and the contactor is able to switch the capacitors into or out of the system. There's a BJT relay and capacitor or contactor cascade for each stage of the capacitor bank. The circuit diagram here on the slide just picks that. So due to the current pandemic, we weren't able to actually test the power factor correction portion of our project, but we are act pretty confident that our design and calculations will work as intended. The chart shown here shows the theoretical values of the correct power factor based on the correct capacitor KVAR combinations available from our capacitor bank. And we have programmed the Arduino to calculate the required capacitance and then introduce the closest combination from our capacitor bank. So our program utilizes a whisker switch to transition between two states A and B when the switch is pressed. Both states will measure the single phase capacitance required, the real and apparent power, the RMS voltage and current, and it calculates the power factor. These values are then printed to the LCD. However, the difference between state A and B is that in state A, the capacitors will be introduced and the new values are calculated. And in state B, uh, the capacitors will be shut off and it will recalculate the values again and print them to the LCD. So the enclosure we have designed to house all of the components of our project is seen here. And the enclosure is made out of plywood and features a swing open door that allows access to the components inside. The LCD on the front door displays uh, the load voltage, current, real power and apparent power and the power factor. We have included quick disconnect plugs on the front of the enclosure to allow us to easily and safely disconnect and disconnect the test load and voltage supply. Shown here is the internal layout of our enclosure. We have a 12 volt battery pack that is used to power the Arduino Uno, the relays, and the non-inverting op amps. The primary breadboard is where the measurement circuits and comparative op amp are located. And our secondary breadboard is used to control the switching circuit. As you can see on the bottom, we have the incoming and outgoing power connections. Uh, here's the price breakdown of our project. As you can see, we stayed within our budget of $500 for this project. Uh, the most expensive items being the capacitors and the relay and contactors, but that's because the voltage and current rating on those items had to be high enough to withstand the demands of the load at any given time. So that concludes our presentation. We can now answer any questions that you may have. So it looks like you had three stages of capacitors. Is that right? Yes, yes sir. Mm -hmm. So in order to, uh, you essentially had to use just uh, one of those three stages or a combination of them in order to uh, correct the power factor? Yes, yes sir. You, would you see any uh, uh, benefit to having additional stages or is that sufficient? Well, yes. additional stages mm -hmm. would be beneficial. It would help us uh, correct different size loads, but for our, within our budget, that's all we could really afford to do is those three stages. Okay. 
I have a question hey, uh, if I could. Thanks. No, go ahead. Uh, my, my question, this is Malcolm, but my question is, um, so I'm assuming this, well, this isn't my question, I'm assuming that this is a, a device you would mount at a, uh, at a motor, for example, and then uh, it would uh, uh, sense the power factor of the load and uh, adjust the, uh, the stages of capacitor to, to create, to, to, cor to attempt to correct the power factor to a 1.0 or as close as possible. Um, so I guess I've got two questions. One, uh, is the, um, what's the possibility of the, uh, the, 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 the controller in, ending up switching uh, uh, stages in and out so that it hunts and you have uh, a lot of uh, operations of the contactor and switching the capacitors in and out and, and wouldn't that cause a, 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 some problems on the line for uh, maybe other equipment if you was hunting? So what, what did you do to, to, to maybe address that possibility? Uh, and did you, uh, did you try to, uh, uh, did you program it so that it would not go leading or, or, does, or did you uh, even think that was a, a problem? No, we programmed it so it wouldn't go leading. That was the one problem we made sure it would never do because I was pretty scared of that. And the program we have in place is that it would calculate the capacitance it needs and then introduce the capacitor and then that'll be it. That would be the capacitor that was staying there, so we'd be going out hunting. Like I'll only introduce one stage of capacitor, and that's as close as one as we can get it to. Very good, thank you. I think someone else has a, had a question as well. Uh, no, I'm. That was, that was actually the same uh, line of question I was going to have. So uh, thank you. But very, uh, very interesting, very, very neat project. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, uh, thanks, guys, for a very good presentation. And at this uh, time, I'm going to request everyone in the audience once again to please uh, use the link that I've uh, already posted uh, earlier and as well as a second ago on the chat window. So if you could please use that and uh evaluate the presentation that you just saw uh <clears throat> it'll be really appreciated
<clears throat> so I think the next group is ready. So at this time, uh, I'm going to hand over to them and they'll be starting their presentation. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Toby Russell, and this is Kyle Carroll, and we have designed a mega ohm meter as our senior design project. It only takes about 100 milliamps to stop the human heart. Current can flow through tissues and interfere with the natural electrical signals passing along information in the human body. That interference can disrupt the signals telling the heart to beat, causing ventricular fibrillation, which leads to unconsciousness and death. In April of 1967, members of the Richardson Gang, also known as the Torture Gang, were given hefty prison sentences for torturing members of rival gangs. The instrument of choice, a hand-cranked megger. These meggers are devices designed to keep people safe through insulation testing. However, they can deliver a harmful shock if misused. The purpose of our project is testing insulation. What does that mean? Basically just measuring a device's uh, resistance to current flow. We generate 250 and 500 volt DC test voltages for our design. What qualifies as good insulation? Well, good insulation means a material has a high resistance to current flow. Insulation deteriorates over time due to environmental factors and the strains of use. Loss of insulation integrity can result in serious injury or possibly death. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see some standard wires with rubber insulation. And then on the right, you can see the insulation in a motor winding. Typically, these windings are, are dipped in insulation or they might have it poured or brushed on. What makes insulation go bad? Well, insulation in the field is subject to a variety of forces. Mechanical damage, vibration, water, dirt, are all just a few of the things that can cause the insulation to fail. The figure on the right is a failed winding in a three-phase motor. <clears throat> Bad insulation, uh, excuse me, insulation failure is the result of teeny cracks forming in the coating of the wires. Once the voltage exceeds the breakdown voltage of the air gap, current will flow. As you can see in these two pictures, there's more examples of failed insulation. The image on the right shows a wires burn up in a computer tower, and the image on the, le um, the right shows a messed up stator winding that where the insulation has failed. Okay, just as a little bit of background on Megers as a whole. Uh, originally, the first handheld Megers uh, used a hand crank to generate their uh, test voltage. That test voltage was then applied to the insulation and the uh, resistance of the insulation was displayed on a analog meter. That analog meter is controlled by a deflecting coil, which you can see in the diagram on the right. Uh, basically, the, as you, uh, the resistance of the insulation will determine how much that coil deflects, which then you can see on the analog meter. But nowadays, we have modern megas which operate off battery power and have a digital display. These can even test up into the kilovolt ranges. They're much faster and much more accurate than old megas. And perhaps the most convenient uh, part about them is that it only takes one operator to use them. But the downside of them is that they're very expensive. As you can see, they can be upward of $4,000. So they're not a very consumer friendly device. So that kind of supports our purpose of this project was to provide a more consumer focused uh, mega. So just uh, to begin our engineering approach, uh, just a general overview of megas as a whole again. They are in essence just a power supply uh, which generates uh, a high DC voltage that DC voltage is then applied to the insulation and then a measurement circuit will measure that resistance and display it to you. So that kind of determined what our main components of our project would be, which the first step would be we'd have to be able to generate that test voltage. And the ones we chose were 500 and 250. 
And then the second step would be measuring it, measuring the, resist the resistance of the insulation and then displaying it on the LCD. We generated these test voltages with a multi-stage DC to DC boost converter. And this circuit's also called the step up chopper. These circuits require a pulse width modulated signal that operates an NMOS transistor as a switch with a specific duty cycle. The functionality of the circuit can be split into two modes, when the switch is open and when the switch is closed. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see a basic diagram of a DC to DC boost converter. It, it not only uses five circuit components and it's relatively simple and the circuits work very well. I'd like to talk about mode one or the first mode when the switch is closed. During that mode, current flows through the switch and inductor charging the coils. It correlates to when the pulse width modulation signal, the square wave signal is high and during this mode charge is stored in the inductor. Uh, the capacitor is discharged to supply the low voltage. On the right you can see a figure of where the current is flowing in, in this uh, mode. Next, mode number two, when the switch is open, current flows through the inductor diode and load and the capacitor is charged. This mode will correlate to when the square wave is low or the input voltage is zero. The inductor is then discharged to boost the voltage. To make these pulse width modulated signals, we may use an A-stable multi-vibrator circuit that implements a 555 timer chip. The capacitor is charged through RA and RB. However, it is only discharge through RB. This way, the ratio of resistors can control the duty cycle for the circuit. Here are the two duty cycles in the timer circuits that we used for our design. We had to have two different duty cycles. One is just a 50% duty cycle. So half the time the signal is high, half the time the signal is low. And that's seen at the top of the figure in yellow. Our other timer circuit generates an 80% duty cycle. That means 80% of the time the square wave is high. Um, this 80% duty cycle is used for the first two stages of our circuit to boost to 250. And the last 50% duty cycle signal is used to boost from 250 to 500. Because we worked with such high voltages, felt it was necessary to etch our own custom circuit boards. Uh, I'd like to quickly go through the process for etching circuit boards. Uh, first, you measure the component size and pin location. Next, you design or lay the traces out in express PCB. After that, you will print the layout on a transparency and you have to be sure that no light passes through the traces. I typically had to stack three or four transparencies on top of each other and, and then continue with the process. Next, you transfer the design to a positive pre-sensitized copper clad board with photolithography. This is a complicated process that I'm not going to go into it. After you have the traces on the copper clad board, you can then etch the copper with ferric fluoric acid. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to remove all the copper from the board. Finally, you can clean the board and drill your holes. Here are two of the boards that are in our circuit that we designed. The one on the left is kind of the control board. It houses the timer circuits, the voltage regulators, and the first stage of the DC, DC boost converter. And then the circuit on the right is our two high voltage DC to DC boost converter circuits. As you can see, a lot of inductors. Okay, before we get into the uh, measurement circuit design, I'm just going to briefly mention the LCD display that we use. Uh, we use a 16 by 2 LCD with an I2C backpack. Uh, the backpack is mainly just there to reduce the complexity of the connection to our microcontroller, which was our Arduino. And we plan to just include the test voltage and the resistance of the insulation that we're testing on this LCD. So now onto the design of the resistance measuring circuit. Uh, we decided to use a multi-stage voltage divider circuit and these stages are meant to provide a seamless range of measurements. And so these uh, known resistors, as they're called, and the 
voltage divider circuit must be balanced correctly to provide that seamless range. As you can see, we've listed uh, which resistors we use for each stage. Now, theoretically, our measurement range for the measurement circuit should be from the mid tens of thousands of ohms to the upper hundreds of mega ohms. In reality, uh, we, are, we can get down to about, uh, uh, about the mid uh, hundreds of thousands of ohms and up into the uh, almost hundreds of uh, mega ohms. And each stage is controlled by an onboard switch. And here you can see just a kind of a rough diagram of the measurement circuit as a whole. You can see switches one through four, which are used to disconnect or connect each stage to the, uh, excuse me, to the uh, circuit. And you can see on the right, the diode that we use to protect the Arduino from voltages higher than five volts. And you can see the uh, resistance under test. Now a little bit on the operation of the measurement circuit. The uh, Arduino reads the voltage across the known resistor, and then the Arduino performs a voltage divider calculation, which then finds the value of the resistance that we're measuring, which will give us the uh, insulation resistance. But if the voltage read by the Arduino is not between 0 0.2 volts and 4 volts, it is considered not in the range of that particular stage. Uh, we chose four volts for the upper uh, range limit just because uh, the diode begins to break down earlier than we expected. So we had to account for that and lower our, our limit to about four volts. But there are drawbacks to the voltage divider circuit. It is a simple solution, but, and because it is simple, it has uh, a couple drawbacks. It is very sensitive to overvoltage, which is dangerous because it could damage the Arduino and the device itself would just cease to work. So that's what the Zener diode is used for. It's to protect that Arduino from voltages on its analog input pins from anything higher than five volts. And then our next drawback is that as the resistance of the insulation we're testing increases, we get an increase in the error. That is due to the limited amount of data points that a Arduino can use. With a, the Arduino operates on a five volt reference. So with only about 1,024 data points within there. So as the resistance of our measurement goes up, the difference in resistance in each data point be becomes higher, which leads to more error. And the last drawback is that the uh, measurement circuit is susceptible to overcurrent should the voltage that we're applying become too high. Now, if that current becomes too high, it can potentially damage the circuit or harm the operator using the device. And we address these drawbacks in multiple ways. Like I mentioned, the overvoltage protection is just a simple five volt uh, Zeno diode. And due to the low current in our measurement circuit, you have to, we had to carefully choose our Zeno diode so that it wouldn't uh, break down too early and, and introduce more error than is desirable. And for our overcurrent protection, we just went with the simplest solution. We went with a uh, fuse. We placed two fuses, one on the uh, battery to uh, limit the overall current going into the device. And we uh, included one in the measurement circuit itself to prevent any dangerous currents from flowing through the measurement circuit and potentially harming whoever's operating the device. Okay, so this is our Gantt chart. This basically depicts how we approached our project. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next two slides because we'd like to perform a little demonstration for y'all. Uh, but the only thing about this Gantt chart that's not totally accurate is the equipment testing. Due to the coronavirus, we were not able to go back to campus and, and run any tests in the lab. 
our budget was relatively low and the, the total cost did not exceed $500 for the projects. Here are some of our test results for actual resistors we, we, we got from the lab. We, uh, the left hand column shows the actual value, you know, red in the color band. The right hand, or the middle column shows the value measured by a multimeter. And the right hand column shows the values measured by our mega. As you can see, our device tracks you know, relatively well with the accurate uh, resistor size. Now, if you can bear with me for just one second, we'd like to do a demonstration for you. Dr. Batari, can you see it? Yes, uh, we can see it. Uh, everyone in the audience, if you could uh, please click on the um, presenter titled uh, Toby Russell Device 2. Uh, I think this is device one, I'm sorry. Toby Russell Device 1, so it will bring you to the uh, demonstration link. Yes, I, I think we can see you, Toby. Please go ahead. Okay, so so this is our uh, beggar as we designed it. Uh, the box ended up being a little bit larger than we we had initially planned, but that was mainly due to the the large battery that we used. Uh, we we decided not to order any specialized batteries, and we went with something that was easily available, easy to charge, and have plenty of current capacity. And then since we put so much time and effort into this project, we figured we might as well show it off a little bit. And so we included the uh, plexiglass sides and the light to where you could see into the inside of the device. Now I'd like to demonstrate our two test voltages. This is the 500 volt test voltage to apply the test voltage. You hit the switch and it's temporary. The light comes on and it shows the test voltage at about 529 volts. Can you show the meter? All right, now I will change the mode of the power supply to the 250 volt test voltage. And then when I apply the voltage, 248, right where it's supposed to be. Now, I'd like to quickly test the resistor that we have that we know the value of. This is a one mega ohm resistor that we measured to be very close to that value with the multimeter. The process is very simple. You apply the leads to either side of the uh, resistor under test, and then Kyle's going to explain the testing process. Okay, so basically, when you want to start testing, you uh... We'll set this switch here all the way down to its uh, bottom position. This is what we call the reset position. And on the uh, LCD, I might it might be a little bit hard to see just because it's so bright and the camera not be picking it up well. But while the uh, while the voltage applied is zero, like it is now, the LCD will display uh, a message that says to reset the switch, and then you can begin testing. So. To start, we will take uh, apply it to our uh, to the uh, resistance that we're testing, the insulation, and we'll flip the switch. And then, as we can see, the LC the resistor that the resistance is not currently in range of this stage, so 
must stop, undo the switch, and then move up the switch by one position. And then we test again. And there we go, it's in range. And we're getting a resistance of about one mega ohm. Well, thank you guys so much for your time and your attention. Please let us know if you have any questions. Okay. Hey, this question. is uh, Matthew. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a question. I was curious, what would you say is the most challenging part of the project as well as what was the best part of it? Oh, sure right here. Huh? I would say the, uh, the most challenging part of the project was designing the initial circuit uh, and, and getting it to work properly. We had a lot of circuit iterations and uh, I don't know, the, the easiest part was, was probably uh, building the circuit boards that really came together. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, yeah, hi, this is uh, Matt Ballot. A uh, question for you on the, um, <clears throat> on the LCD display, that talks directly to the, uh, to the, R to the uh, microcontroller, is that, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and how, how, um, how long did it take y'all to get that program where it would, you know, display what you wanted to display and such? Was that a was that tricky or was that pretty straightforward? Because it was some out of the box, um, you know, uh, uh, protocols. Um, it's uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, and because of the uh, I2C backpack, the connections to the microcontroller are very simple. And then after that, uh, to use an I2C. Uh, LCD, you have to download some uh, libraries so that the uh, Arduino knows how, uh, what kind of signals to send to it and how to interface with it. But once you have those libraries and everything, the code is very simple. Uh, I'd say it was uh, relatively easy to have to set it all up. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh... Just uh, my little one sitting here watching this with me because we're we're at home on quarantine as well, and uh, she really thought it was neat when y'all showed the inside. So I'm happy y'all had that uh, that viewport. So uh, thumbs up on style points there. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. Any more questions? Uh, I was curious. Um, did y'all evaluate the Arduino is just basically driving that screen, yeah? Could you repeat that, sir? The Arduino's use is driving the screen and performing the, the voltage division? Yes, sir. Yes. The calculations. Did y'all weigh uh, the options or potential of not using an Arduino? Uh, we did. Able, think you think you could have fabricated it without the screen? What was that? You think you could have fabricated it without the screen or without the Arduino using... Uh, different chips or something perhaps? Well, we had initially thought about doing an analog style with, with the coil and a needle, a uh, lifelike scene, but we, we thought the digital output would be better for the final design. And, and then we just went with the Arduino because it was the simplest, most readily available way for us to approach that problem. I agree. Did y'all, I saw y'all did a test there with, uh, with the resistor, did y'all perform any insulation tests like on wire or anything like that? No, sir, we, we were not able to perform any insulation tests. We, we, we wanted to go to the power lab on campus and connect it to some of the big machines and whatnot. But like I said, due to the Corona virus and all of that, we were not able to do any of, of, of those tests. Quick question if I could. Uh, how does this, uh, what you've done here, which looks very nice, I might add, how does it compare to uh, the uh, commercially available uh, testers that are used to do this uh, same function? Well, it's cheaper for a start. Uh, but 
our design it um it's just kind of a different version it uh most commercial versions are probably going to use a transformer to generate the test voltage and the, the novel part of, of this design was that we used dc to dc boost converters uh to, to generate the test voltage it was kind of a, a different way of approaching it from from what our understanding was and the, good. uh the differences in performance really like the uh more like cons the uh consumer ones that you can go and buy uh the, like toby said they'll be more expensive but uh, just due to the high-end components that they use in their circuits and uh, the quality of, of, of it all, they uh, might be uh, just a little bit uh, more accurate than ours. We tried to make ours as accurate as possible with what we had, but the ones that you can buy that are obviously more expensive than ours will probably uh, perform much better. How important is accuracy, uh, would you think, when it comes to uh, measuring the, uh, the, the, the resistance value of the installation and knowing if there's a problem? Um, you know, I, I don't think it's highly important to be, get a very accurate number when you're talking about the dis difference between 10.1 and 10.5 mega ohms. You know, I mean, I mean you're, you're still up there at the high range. So as, as long as you can prove that it's got a very high resistance, you know, accuracy isn't quite the most important part. Thank you. Uh, during your initial research stages, Joel, I know you talked about motor windings and stuff as one area of use for this. Uh, were there any other applications outside of that that y'all noticed when you did your initial research? Uh, you, you know, the device is designed to be tested or able to connect to any consumer uh, device and test the insulations. So you should be able to just test the insulation of a wire or, or test a motor or, or any, anything, even a computer. You could look in and see if there's a short somewhere. And our, uh, our, lower, our lower voltage, the 250 uh, volt test uh, voltage, you could use to uh, test the insulation with on like household appliances if you wanted to. Uh, so like, especially like a dryer, like a clothes dryer, insulation in those is very important. So you could use it to test the insulation within any household appliance that you have. We had um, originally wanted to make an oil insulation tester, a device that uh, basically measured the voltage breakdown in insulating oils like transformer oil but the voltages required for that were in the thousands of volt range and so we had to come back down into just kind of a standard insulation tester. That's very good. I was, I was curious uh, how much all I got into it. This is a megameter is actually used uh, in aviation world for airfield lighting uh, quite a lot actually they do insulation resistance tests um, and there the FAA's minimum accepted value is 50 mega ohms per circuit. Okay. Yeah my buddy that works for Halliburton they actually use a mega like we showed in the uh, the picture for testing some of the downhole instrumentation uh, on completion some of the completion nice. tools that they use. Stuff. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, thanks guys for a very good presentation and a great project. Uh, at this time, I'm, I'm once again going to request all of our audience to please use the link that I've just posted on the chat window to uh, go ahead, use the link to e evaluate the project. Uh, and like I said, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll give you four or five minutes for that. And then we should be ready for the next presentation in three or four minutes. <clears throat> well, thank you guys. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.
So I think our next group is ready with their presentation. So let me hand over to the next group. So guys, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for showing for our presentation. And my name is Tristan Becknell. My name is Jeremy Gonzalez. And I'm Taylor Moro. And my name is Andrew Senor, and our group has developed a variable resistance soft starter. It's a slight variation on the primary resistor type of soft starter for induction motors. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so over the course of this presentation, uh, in a moment here, I'm gonna kind of cover our specific aims of what we had hoped to accomplish when we set out. Uh, Taylor and Tristan will take over for more of our engineering approach and technical design aspects where Jeremy will cover the project management and at the end, we'll all kind of talk about testing and do a limited demonstration uh, with what we can manage based on the current world circumstances. So for our specific aims, uh, the primary goal of this is to reduce inrush current. Inrush current, of course, being the uh, overdraw of current whenever induction motors or induction machines are starting up. These can typically be anywhere from six to 10 times the normal operating current or the full load amperage of an induction machine. Uh, our goal initially was to reduce it to about 200% of what that full load amperage typically is based off of where other soft starters of the similar operating principle managed to get their performance. Um, it's important even if this method isn't exactly as good as others because uh, the primary resistor method is mostly good for starting motors that'd be doing things like pumps or uh, conveyor belts, things that experience a little more damage if they're accelerated abruptly as well. Um, and it's estimated furthermore that anywhere from 75 to 85% or even higher uh, of the motors used in industry are induction type motors. So anything interesting discovered over the course of this could possibly be applied to that as well. Uh, so next slide, please. <clears throat> Aside from testing for the 200% reduction in inrush current, uh, this is just the safety setup that we used during our experiments when we were connecting to our three phase power. Uh, that's the main application of this is for three phase motors. Uh, we also additionally wanted to examine uh, heat dissipation issues just based off of the energy consumption of larger three-phase motors. Heat was anticipated to be a large problem. It wasn't as bad as we had expected, but we'll talk about that a little more later. We also wanted to test the speed of our machine. We were slightly worried that due to it being somewhat mechanical, in its construction uh, that we would see a little bit of reduction in responsiveness and it would take uh, longer than necessary to start our machine up as well. So we did a few tests to check for the responsiveness of our device as well. Uh, on the next slide here, we can see that we have the faceplate for the specific motor that we developed this for. Uh, we are only capable of functioning properly on a 230 volt RMS three phase, three horsepower induction motor. Uh, given that that was at the university's power lab, it made it a little difficult to get all the testing data that we want. We managed to get a small amount, although we will give a small demonstration later with a smaller single phase motor to kind of show it live in action. Uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Tristan and Taylor to talk about the engineering and technical design aspects. Going into our engineering design, our initial design was to make uh, three single phase circular rheostats that were mounted and the wipers were mounted on a common shaft. Uh, we wanted the diameter of these uh, rheostats to be around four to six inches. We wanted to be pretty compact and the wipers being on a common shaft, we would make it pretty easy for all three rheostats to be at the same resistiveness. We ran into problems with this pretty quickly. Uh, main problem was our budget. Uh, this design being four to six inches was made the price go extraordinarily outside of our uh, capable budget. So we kind of looked at it at maybe making it a little bit smaller, a little bit larger. Uh, problems with it being smaller was we had to find a motor that was extremely accurate. Uh, any changes in resistance would be not, any changes in the wiper uh, where the wiper is would be a massive change in resistance. 
then we looked at it making it larger. Uh, we ran problems with that. A, being larger, make it a little bit heavier, harder to uh, move around. And then also it would be uh, require a stronger motor to turn the wipers on a bigger rheostat. Uh, so our final design is very similar in functionality, uh, but so we're still using the uh, single phase or three single phase uh, rheostats, but we're using kiln bricks as a core that was donated by the Louisiana Tech Art Department. And then we are using nichrome wire wrapped around this. Uh, the reason we used kiln bricks was it is an insulator and it had a very high heat resistiveness. Uh, this is important. We didn't know how hot our wires could potentially get when we actually ran it through a motor. Uh, and then we used nichrome wire to be the resistive material. This kind of hit the sweet spot of having the necessary resistance per inch, but ohms per inch. Uh, and this design may have been larger than our initial design of the four to six inch circular rheostat, but we do think it is compact enough, uh, easy enough to carry with two people. Uh, and really importantly, this does, this did fit inside our budget. Uh, and then kind of just looking at our flow chart on this next slide here, this was something we did early on in the year. And this remains true to, uh, to the day. So as Andy mentioned before, we're getting 230 volts RMS, three phase. Uh, and then a current sensor is going to read the current that would be going into the rheostat and telling the controller the current. The 24 volt DC power supply is uh, powering both the controller and the DC motor. So the controller looks at the current sensor and tells the DC motor how uh, and you can speed up or slow down, and then the DC motor controls where the viper position is going to be, and then the rheostat will control how the motor is going to function. Uh, and now Taylor will kind of go more and over the current sensor and the controller. So this is the schematic for the current sensor. Uh, it's a basic BJT common emitter amplifier and it takes the current flowing through one of the phases and converts it into a voltage. And then that voltage is then sent to the amplifier and amplified to a range of voltage that the microcontroller can read and then adjust the stepper motor to what position it needs to be in. And the output we biased at, at 1.65 volts, which is roughly half of the operating voltage of the microcontroller. And we made it and developed it so that we can easily adjust and calibrate the current sensor to our needing. And next slide. So in order to control the stepper motor, we opted to use a A4988 stepper motor driver. And some of the reasons that we use this driver up compared to other ones, because it was readily available, it was cheap, and if at any point test in testing or operation, the module gets damaged, we can easily take the module out of the control board and replace it with another one. And it also comes with current limiting function to prevent damage to the separate motor if any point that the separate motor draws too much current. It also has micro stepping ability so we can get better precision of where the wiper bar can be on the rheostats and it also has, uh, it can also be disabled and enabled to reduce power consumption through the driver and the motor itself. Next slide. So in order to make contact with the rheostats, we had to find some way that we can easily uh, make contact with the rheostats and we opted to use copper pipes. Uh, we cut them to length and crush them uh, slightly to make an oval shape so that it can create more surface air and contacting with the uh, rheostats. Uh, we use nylon screws and 3D printed mounts to help isolate from the wiper bar. So there was no possibility that the each phase could short out with each other. And the stepper motor drives the steel bar along the rheostats from left to right. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Jeremy for the timeline. Yep, project management. Every engineer has to have, no one likes doing it. Um, starting with our timeline here, we wanted to have a couple days to figure out exactly what the motor was doing with normal operation, the normal, you know, six to 10 times uh, inrush current and sort of get a feel of what was going on. 
Uh, the next big chunk of our project was really designing and making a rheostat. Um, that was going to be pretty much the core of our project. Uh, it pretty much would work or fail depending on how well the rheostat was made. And we had a lot of issues kind of come into that, such as potential heat issues and material issues and stuff like that. Um, sort of a subset during designing the rheostat was designing something to drive it, i.e. the DC motor and driving mechanisms. Um, and once that was finished, you can kind of start on designing the current sensor. After that, we, we decided to pick out a power supply, sort of at the end of the current sensor. And finally, we started building the control mechanism once all the other pieces were sort of in place. Um, the only really thing that got really interrupted here was, unfortunately, we were only able to test one day due to uh, the unfortunate pandemic that's currently happening. Um, and so I'm going to continue on to the budget. This was our original budget. Um, it's completely wrong. We ended up spending much more than this initial budget, but this is what was based off of other devices on the market and roughly what we thought we could pay for, for things. Moving on to the actual budget, the more important slide. Um, here you can see we spent $336.81, um, which is a little bit over our original budget, by about 50%. Um, the big cost here was really affording proper resistive material in the form of nine chrome wire. And the uh, 16 gauge was very important because we wanted to make sure that it could survive uh, the thermal load that we put on it at maximum load. Um, and you'll see in testing later about that. The other big parts is because our device got bigger, uh, unfortunately we had to spend more on housing the device and stuff like that, that it kind of inflated the cost even further. Um, but overall, we're still really happy with the price point uh, compared to the alternatives, which would have been magnitudes higher in cost um, in the multiple thousands range for the next best material we could find uh, for our project. Uh, moving on to testing. Uh, so we did, we were able to do numerous testing with our limited time in the lab. Uh, we weren't able to do as many trials as we would like for each experiment, but for each experiment we ran it at least three separate times. Uh, we are very confident, we're so confident in our data because we, all three times we got extremely consistent data for each measurement. Uh, so our first test that we were able to do was to measure the motor and it's unloaded, so not connected to anything. And then our rheostat at its maximum or full resistance. This resistance was around 9.2 ohms on each phase. Uh, and we were able to measure the current to be six amps. Uh, this is not the inrush current. This is just after the motor gets to uh, its maximum speed. And then we also measure the voltage between each phase to be 190 volts. This was kind of expected. We expected the voltage drop because we were adding resistance to our system, to the motor. So we were expecting a uh, voltage drop. And then we also measured the RPM of the motor at its uh, maximum speed. And this did not change. So our system did not change its value and we got it to be around 3,600 RPM. In this experiment, we had no heating issues with our coils. Uh, in future experiments, this issue does appear, uh, does happen. Uh, our next test is still going to have the motor be unloaded, but we changed our reassets to have virtually no resistance. I think we measured it to be around 0.5 ohms of added resistance. There were still resistance in the motor, of course, but our, our uh, soft solder did not add any resistance, uh, very little resistance. The current did not change, uh, and then the voltage did increase to 206 volts. This was expected because there's less resistance, so a smaller voltage drop. Uh, once it started up, the motor RPM was still at 360 RPM. And again, there was no heating issues uh, during this experiment. Taylor will now go into more details about the inrush current. So one of our main goals was to keep the inrush current below 20 amps, which is about 200% of the full load amperage. And as you can see on the oscilloscope, we captured the inrush current at the start of the motor and we set the calibrated probe to five amps per volt and then the oscilloscope to one volt per division. And we got about a peak of 3.5 division, which equaled out to about 17.5 amps. So we, we achieved our goal with the unloaded test of keeping the current below 20 amps. Next slide. So this video shows the unloaded motor starting up with the soft starter in operation. It, the RPM does reach its 
3,600 RPM almost instantaneously. So there was no delay compared to with the motor hooked straight to power. And this showing the voltage of the motor at no resistance and moving back. Next slide, I'll turn it over to Jeremy again for more testing data. So this time the test included uh, the motor being loaded, in this case a denometer, um, and as, as you can see, it was drawing, uh, when it was finally running, it was drawing t double the normal uh, full load amperage and having a very low um, voltage at 65. It also was not really spinning at all. Um, this was pretty much expected for it to be at maximum resistance of our rheostat and to be loaded that it would not really function properly. However, on the bright side, there was no glowing orange bits. Uh, it was no apparent heat issues, which was great. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this test was uh, loaded with minimum resistance on a rheostat. And once it got going, as you can see, uh, it had a full load current at 10 amps and had a, a full load, um, full resistance a voltage of 230 volts, meaning that when the device had finally finished its startup phase, it was running as intended. And as you can see, um, it was running at expected speed of 3,600 RPMs. However, the last little bit of a rheostat was glowing orange, indicating that it was having some minor to major heat issues. Uh, and moving on to our final big point, our loaded test, um, as you can see, did achieve our goal. Um, as you can see here, it is five amps slash volts with two volts slash deviation, meaning that if you look closely, the inrush current is at 15 amps, meaning that we capped with a loaded system, uh, current inrush current at 15 amps, which is below our 20 amp limit, meaning we achieved our goal successfully on a loaded system. Moving on to a video of operation. As so, it's starting to spin up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, these next few videos here uh, show the test that we had performed for the dynamometer loaded motor in the lab. Uh, the response time was about 15 seconds for full acceleration versus 10 seconds for the unassisted acceleration. Uh, so like we said, we managed to get our 15 amp inrush current reduction. On the next video, we can see the internals of the machine during the same test as it goes uh, all the way from the maximum resistance, yeah, maximum resistance to the lowest resistance. Uh, for all the testing, we simply had the wiper bar uh, cycle all the way through both directions just so that we could see the performance going up and coming down from it. In this last video here, uh, before our live demonstration, if I could draw your attention to the red alligator clip on the right side of the screen, if you'll watch the small piece of wire right next to that, you'll see it glows red hot very briefly. We did a number of tests uh, with the testing at fixed full resistance, fixed low resistance, and we discovered that we only see this issue as the wiper bar approaches the lower end of our rheostat, which would be the area of uh, least often operation. Uh, Ideally, we would have a bypass circuit that uses conductive wire once the rheostat gets to the bottom of its resistive value, so that way we don't see heating issues like this. Estimating with a heat chart uh, based off of metal colors, we got a rough estimate of it being somewhere between 750, 850 degrees Celsius versus the 1400 degrees Celsius melting point of nichrome. So we're not particularly worried about uh, the transient phases that it would be in this operational area. Uh, more so just ensuring that it doesn't wind up there for uh, extended durations. Uh, turning over, if you will direct your attention to uh, Taylor Moreau's screen, he has the device set up with a single phase motor and we'll be able to do a quick little live operation of it. Uh, okay, so can everybody see my screen or see the motor? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, so... so yeah. Basically, we have this set up to be 
a single phase motor going through one phase, and then the voltmeter is the voltage at the motor. So I'll turn it on, I'll turn the motor on, and you'll see that the motor is at full speed right now. So there's no RPM difference of it started and finishing the whole uh, control process. And then I'll plug in the controller for the software. And you can see the voltage changing as the soft starter moves through operation. Okay. And that is the demonstration. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Andy to do future designs. So as far as things that we would like to implement, should we continue this project later on in the future? As we said, um, implementing some sort of bypass system to uh, prevent the heating issues that we saw at the end there. Our original design, we had hoped to keep everything completely within the resistor and forego the use of any switching components as switching components and soft starters tend to add a little bit of uh, disturbance as they move from one side of the circuit to the other. But I think that as far as safety concerns, it would be a uh, good sacrifice to have one of those in there. We'd also like to implement a limit switch at the uh, highest end of the rheostats uh, wiper bar. So that way in the case of any power interruption, it would be much easier to uh, calibrate ourselves to the starting position of our stepper motors uh, range. Uh, as far as heat issues, other things that we considered for potentially larger motors that would dump more heat through our rheostat is either air cool uh, vents powered by fans or in case this is expanded to a particularly large motor perhaps even a transformer oil submersion to aid with a little bit of our heat dissipation. Uh, but in conclusion we did manage to reduce uh, our inrush current to below 200 percent of the FLA of our motor which was 10 amps so we never saw above 20 amps during our testing and we managed to make it in a package that isn't uh, struggling to necessarily keep up with the speed of acceleration of most of our motors. Are there any questions on our project? Uh, yes, this is Malcolm Smoke. I'd like to ask a quick question. I know you're probably running short on time. Uh, what, what made you decide that this was a project that you wanted to do? What, what, what problem were you trying to solve? Uh, can you maybe address that just briefly? Uh, yes, I can field that one for you. Uh, so the main application region that we had in mind with this was, uh, as I said earlier in the presentation, things like irrigation pumps or conveyor belt systems. Uh, primary resistor type soft starters like this one uh, have a large advantage in really smoothing out the inrush current, whereas some other soft starters will still have a good large spike, but then level out quickly based off the research that we saw. So this would help with a couple of things, mainly the acceleration of the motor would be a lot more smooth than other methods. That's what we were hoping to accomplish through the rheostat instead of using switching transistors, I'm oh, sorry, switching resistors. Um, and that would prevent issues such as water hammer and the irrigation pipes from damaging the connected systems or the uh, stretching of belts in the conveyor systems. You're on mute. Uh, yes, I don't believe I can hear you, sir. Your your video is on mute. Oh, sorry about go. that. So, does the uh, you probably said this, and I probably missed it. Does does the uh, the speed at which the uh, resistors are taken out of the circuit does that change, or is it the same speed every time? Um, let's see, uh, Taylor, do you want to take this one, or shall I? Yeah. So. Uh, for initial testing, we just basically moved it back and forth, but with our current probe working, it basically takes the RMS current that's flowing through one of the phases and then takes the differential current and speeds up the motor if the differential current is lower than the initial point or it's 
if it's higher, then it slows down the motor so it stays at a constant uh, change in current. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? And this may be somewhat related, to, or uh, you may have already addressed this, but uh, um, what were y'all, what was this, or why did y'all decide to go about using the resistor type versus like an SCR diode or thyristor type soft start? Um, uh, it kind of comes down to budget, uh, and this was, uh, kind of came up, or one of our teachers brought this. Uh, our, this design, this idea, at least, to our attention, and he, we really wanted to try to make it, you know, as this style of uh, make it a smooth transition and be also affordable for uh, our budget. Probably, that's probably a true statement. I, I've never had gone out and priced SDRs and thyristors. It's probably pretty expensive. Yes. That was our probably largest issue with this project was trying to find something that worked within our budget. Um, resistive material was a long and uh, quite interesting process to try to find something that worked um, and ended up microwire worked quite well. Did y'all by happen to look in y'all's research the difference between the VFDs and soft starters and when it's appropriate <clears throat> to use a soft starter versus a VFD? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Um, we typically found that VFDs were much more um, appreciated in applications where some degree of speed control was necessary, whereas soft starters were typically more geared towards operations that were fire and forget where you start them up and then after they've started up, you just want them to run at a constant maximum pace. Any other questions? Any other questions, anyone? Oh, all right. Thanks, guys, for a great presentation and a very good project. And once again, I'm, I'm going to have to request uh, everyone in the audience to please use the, uh, the link again to evaluate the uh, project. You can use the same link as previous, or I've just uh, posted it again. So while we do that, we'll uh, request the next group to set it up and then we should be ready in the next two or three minutes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Robert, are you ready? Yeah. Dr. Pratari, is it okay if we start? Hey, give, give everyone a couple of more minutes to fill out the evaluations. Okay. Give a couple of more minutes. What is next?
Okay, so if everyone is ready, uh, I guess our next group is ready with their presentation. So uh, I'll let Robert and Owen take it from here. All right, um, this is, I'm Owen Sutka and this is um, our project. It's a self-driving car paired with the mesh network to share localization data. This is Robert Brown. Yeah, I'm Robert Brown, yeah. Um, so the goals of the project, we want to improve the safety and reliability of the self-driving cars. We're going to be doing this by building an actual prototype model of the cars, and then we're going to put them into a localized network, a uh, mesh network, uh, using IEEE uh, 802.11s uh, protocols. And then we're going to share some data through those cars over the network to see if that actually improves their uh, abilities. Great. OK, so uh, the question is, why this project? Uh, well, self-driving cars are rapidly growing in use. You're starting to see them more and more often in the news, like especially Tesla's. Um, but even at Tesla's only a level two out of a five for self-driving capabilities. So we're looking at ways that this, um, like its safety could be improved. Um, so complex situations with self-driving cars can lead to um, causing the car to get confused and wreck. Um, it might not see a pedestrian, might not see another car. So we're looking at ways to fix that. So current self-driving cars are usually limited by what they individually can see. They'll have cameras and they'll have radar, LIDAR, that kind of stuff. And each car individually will be able to see other cars in its local area, uh, but they aren't connected on a network, which is what we're trying to show can work. Um, so an object seen by one car um, can then transfer through the network to another car that might not be able to see it due to obstructions in the road. Okay, uh, what if we worked on, or this kind of more of an overview of the layers of the project. First, we kind of started with a Teensy car controller. That's, we have an RC car and we retrofitted it with a Teensy microcontroller. Um, it's similar to an Arduino. Um, we also have a TX2, which is a higher level computer. It runs Linux and that allows us to have cameras and connect to things like Bluetooth controllers. There's also the power system, which powers the car and the computer and the motors. Um, connected to the main computer, which is the TX2, we have the mesh network, that's 802.11s. And built on top of that mesh network is a data sharing layer, which allows us to actually share the data between cars. So for the Teensy car controller, we use a Teensy 3.2. We actually got the uh, newest version, but we we're worried that some of the libraries might not work on it. So we decided to just go for an earlier version of the 3.2. Um, and then we connected that to the uh, GPS module that we had, which is Adafruit, using a serial connection, and then to an IMU to get acceleration and velocity data through I squared C bus. And then for the servo and steering motors, we had PWM signals. Uh, or I guess for the, uh, the steering and throttle motors, we had PWM signals. And then we uh, controlled a motor controller for the throttle one. Um, and then we had some up and down converters in the system to just kind of regulate power to each component to make sure we didn't go above or below what they needed. Uh, so you can kind of see the setup here. Um, we have the IMU connected directly to the board over here um, and then the GPS module as well. And then we have a voltage controller that is going to the bigger voltage uh, controller we have over here that was actually regulating power to the motors and to the uh, the TNC itself. We just need different levels. Um, you'll notice some of the components like the TX2 development board over here is actually a Raspberry Pi and that's just because Fritzing didn't have the uh, symbols that we needed to use. Okay, so um, each TX2, well that's each car really, uh, has three cameras connected. Two of the cameras are actually a camera pair, so we get two nearly ident identical images and that allows us to create a depth image so we can kind of see distance and get a feel for that. And we also have one camera that's facing backwards. Uh, that's just a rear view camera. So not much beyond that. Um, this is the battery stuff. I'm gonna let do this. Uh, so this is our power system. Our power system, we built it out of 18650 batteries. They're very common uh, lithium ion batteries, 3.6 volts each. And the ones we bought specifically have a capacity of 3,500 milliamp hours and a max current of about 10 amps. So we originally used only four of these batteries. 
two in parallel, two in series to give us 7.4 volts and a max current of 20 amps. But we found out that the inrush current of our motor was more than 20 amps. And so we had to increase our batteries to eight batteries and that allowed us to go up to 40 amps, which also increased our capacity to 1400 milliamp hours, which is a good bit. And it allows us to run for five, six hours with no problem. Um, now for the mesh network. Um, this was implemented based off of some tutorials we saw online for the 802.11s protocols, uh, the IEEE protocols. Um, basically, we have a Raspberry Pi in the top left here that's purple. That one is treated as a gateway to the internet so that way we can download any kind of um, uh, files or libraries we might need for the TX2s. This then can connect through the mesh network to any TX2s or Raspberry Pis we have on the network. Uh, and this includes a bridge, which allowed us to uh, actually access it through this bridge. Right now, I can actually access the TX2s that are in Robert's um, uh, room right there uh, from my home in Texas. Uh, I was actually playing around with that before. We just use SSH, go into the bridge. Uh, we've got a password and all that. And then I can access the TX2s and the Raspberry Pi. A little bit slow. Okay. Oh, is this me? Yes. All right. So uh, the, we, with our mesh network right now, we are able to connect, uh, measure the latency, which is the delay in milliseconds between the nodes, the different cars. And we can also measure the, oh, this is just the latency on the slide. Um, so measuring the latency between the nodes gave us about 20 to 30 milliseconds, which is about average for most um, network connections and allow it's good enough to where we can send data in real time. And then on the data sharing layer, basically this is um, based on latency. Um, we use zero MQ as a communication protocol for the mesh because it didn't require any um, server side, anything like no higher level computation. It was just publishers and subscribers. So we had everybody being a publisher on the mesh and everybody being a subscriber. So that way, whenever a car published to all of its subscribers, which is all the cars in the mesh, every car could see it. Um, and then uh, the network sockets are stored in a Python list. We use a lot of Python for this project because it's quick to prototype and build. Okay, so the uh, data we were sharing with ZMQ, uh, it's, we put it in a string format called JSON. It's basically just values separated by commas. Um, if you look in that picture, we have values like roll, pitch, um, heading, latitude, longitude, such like that. And we package that in the JSON string and we can just send that over the wireless network to every other car. And that's how we share it currently. It should also be noted that we could get the GPS data uh, when it was outside, but this was taken while it was inside in the setup that we have right now. So it came out as nada. Um, so now time for the demonstration videos. Let's see if they will run without crashing. Uh, these are our pre-recorded videos. Uh, we also have a live demonstration for after these, just to edit that out. Yeah, these are like 30 second videos. But basically the cars can drive around. They can see we didn't have enough time to implement the proper learning algorithms to actually avoid obstacles and stuff like that, although that was a big goal of ours. We have all the data sharing going on. So right now this car is actually able to share data about its location, uh, direction, acceleration, and velocity. Um, um, and uh, yeah. Currently, the both these videos are showing the car being manually controlled with a Bluetooth controller. Uh, that's mm -hmm. as he said, we weren't able to fully work on, uh, sorry, the train's coming by. We weren't able to fully work on autonomous driving with the, uh, Yeah, the rest of the train. Um, okay. But yeah, so this is all done with the controller and it's just able to go pretty far down the hallway and then come back if we took out the controller and just use the autonomous driving algorithms that we were planning to develop and that we probably will develop after this just for fun. Um, it will have infinite range basically. I'm gonna stop before it crashes. Um, are there any questions? Okay, um, let me share my screen. Okay, yes, oh yeah, let's do the demonstration for real. Can you 
see this? Uh, yes. Okay, so on this screen right here, um, I have connected remotely to each of the two cars. I know it's just kind of looks like a lot of text right now. But uh, what it's doing, every time it publishes data to the network and every other car, it prints it out. And then every time it receives some data, it will print that out like over here. Currently right now, my connection to the two cars is bad because my wireless network is not too good. So it takes a while to update, but it's showing it being printed out right here. Now, I additionally have the car set up to where I can show you driving them around. I just need to move over to do that. I need to switch my cameras. Okay, so. Uh, right here, this is a demonstration for our camera feed on the cars. Sorry, I do not have an optimal setup. If you go ahead and pin his video, it'll actually make it the largest one there. Um, am I showing it right here? Okay. So the camera feed right here, well, it's a normal feed at the bottom. There's my hand moving in front of it. And then at the top, it's not that good currently because we did not adjust the parameters, but that is a disparity image, which is essentially a depth image by taking the difference between two images since we do have a pair of cameras right here. And I additionally have our second car right here set up to drive around. I'm sorry, I'm one-handed right now, and this is kind of difficult. Um, one second. The car appeared to have lost connection. So this is actually something we have to deal with a lot with the cars is them just losing connection either to the mesh network or to the controllers themselves. Um, and you'll notice that we have an alpha card on there as well that was actually used to connect to the mesh network because the TX2 didn't actually have a, um, a network uh, card on there that could uh, conform to the IEEE 802.11s standards. It was only set up for general Wi-Fi standards. Um, so we had to go ahead and add on an alpha card to make it work. Uh, the Raspberry Pis in the network, the gateway and the, um, the bridge, those two could work fine on their own because they were built for the 802.11s standard. So I'll have to restart the car. It lost connection and restarting it is the only way to make it get connection again, unfortunately. And that's part of the reason because we made it so it starts up from boot. So all the programs run as soon as it starts. I have the second car inside set up to um, the monitor. So I have the motors unplugged so I don't accidentally drive it off the table. So that's why I cannot show that one. So. It takes a few seconds to start up, unfortunately. The uh, TX2 NVIDIA board is actually known for um, high level of processing power, which is why we chose it um, versus like a Raspberry Pi. Although we weren't able to do the algorithms that would require that kind of level of complexity, we're definitely planning on using them afterwards. Uh, I know Robert's gonna be working in Oregon on some research projects. Um, and he's going to be working basically with drone networks that are very similar to this. And uh, I'm probably going to try and build something similar out of this and put it on a drone and see if I can fly it around or maybe even just keep it on the car, see what I can do with it. There's a lot of power behind this project and we're pretty excited about what we can do.
So Robert, if you can't get it going. Um, uh, yeah, the go. second car is just taking a second to connect um, to the first car and it's being finicky. I mean, it's possible that's because you're outside. So I can't Yeah, I did go away car. from the um, inside. I have the main Raspberry Pi that Owen is connected through actually from Texas. And it, it's kind of the center mesh that I'm connected through and it might be just overloaded. Well, there's definitely a lot of upgrades that could be done. Yeah, car. I might just go over to the other car. I gotta switch my video. But we have this car currently set up to drive around. Here we go. I have the steering going. Yeah. But I have the throttle unplugged because it's on a table. Yeah, I think that's our project there. That is our project, yes. <laughs> All right. All right, any questions, anyone from the audience? At what level of, of autonomy do you feel like this is gonna be required at? You mentioned that Tesla's are currently at level two out of five. All right. Okay, I'm so Robert into that one, yeah. Uh, we believe this would be really useful once you start getting to um, level three and four. Uh, what that means, level three is when a self-driving car is capable of driving by itself, but a user, the driver only kind of needs to pay attention. Level four is the driver does not need to pay attention at all. So it's at that point when the uh, car starts fully operating by itself, um, that technology like this would be very useful to be able to share data. Yeah, and especially if you know the locations of all the cars in the network, say every single car was self-driving, then basically you would never have to worry about crashing the cars together because they'd always know their own location and the locations of all cars in their local area. So that was the main idea. Have you, have you, all, um, have you all looked at with this mesh network and the cars knowing the locations of the other cars? Um, have you all looked at any kind of um, or considered that you could use it to maybe optimize traffic flow uh, in congested areas? Uh, you don't get that. Yeah, this is uh, yes. <laughs> yes, one of have. our original ideas is how we came up with this, looking at ways to improve traffic flow. And if we could connect this data also with um, a traffic intersection, for example, then that traffic intersection mm -hmm. would be the of every car. And that's kind of where we're going with it. Okay. Well, very interesting. Yeah, and very say interesting the, uh, in general. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, um, say that we only had a few cars on there. That's why we added on the cameras and the other sensors that we could get. Um, because that way we'd actually have a sense of the surroundings as well, even if they aren't built into the network themselves. So um, that was kind of spreading out op to... Optimally, had we um, implemented more self-driving capabilities, we would also share the sort of stuff that the computer vision algorithm sees. So if the camera were to be detecting objects such as like street signs, pedestrians, obstructions in the road, it would also share that sort of stuff over the uh, network. Oh, okay, so it publish it back out. Okay, very cool. Okay. Just to make sure I understood correctly, so you were able to choose the, the, the cars, you were having to drive them down the hallway or they, they, they controlled themselves or what is that? We were uh, we were manually driving them in those videos, yes. Uh, we were showing uh, like, the functions of the cars themselves good, like we're working. Yeah, but um, if we wanted to, we could just plug in a bunch of data to make it run down the hallway in the same kind of format. Um, but it would give us a lot less control. So we didn't want to do that for the demonstration purposes. Yeah, the, um, the code that we control it through is written in Python. So with that, we could very easily attach um, like scripts to run it or attach an AI algorithm to self-drive it. And so the original idea before the Corona hit was um, that we detect objects first, um, locate them and then have it basically driving around uh, and sharing that object data over the network so that other cars would know to avoid it, whether or not they saw those objects. Um, and that was kind of the last part of the project. 
So I know y'all didn't get um, as far as you wanted to, um, but what, what considerations or discussions did y'all have uh, regarding uh, cybersecurity with uh, these uh, networks and uh, with, you know, safety at hand? Okay. Right. So, uh, I'll, yeah. Do you want me to answer that or do you want to? I'll answer it. Uh, basically, we knew that the networks are very weak. Basically, we put a bunch of cars onto a mesh network where anything could act as a node on it and then drive the cars around autonomously if they wanted to. The idea for the final impl implementation of this in the real world would be that the cars would not receive any data that would cause them to drive in any certain way um, from other cars. That would all be within the car itself. Um, so none of the outside data coming in would define them to like crash into each other based off of some malicious actors trying to make them crash into each other basically. Um, um, but there is no network security on this car. <laughs> ideally for a real world impl implementation, you would also be working with um, more complex cryptographic uh, signing techniques to sign your data as being real and official. And then whenever you send that data, other cars could verify that it's actual data. However, we didn't go that far. We just kept it as a plain text. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. Given uh, what you've got is your hardware set up on this prototype, um, what, I guess, what's like the, the speed of propagation for the data between that network? Is that hardware limited entirely or are there other factors, code and whatnot, that could affect the speed? Um, so the speeds of mesh networks tend to be a little bit slower than like a traditional Wi-Fi network because it's less of a direct connection. So that latency speed I said before of about 20 milliseconds between the cars is probably what you expect between each node in the network. So when we're designing our, if we're, this is like a full scale implementation and we designed a full scale version where there was many cars in the network, we would probably have to define like a certain region that it would actually translate data through. Otherwise, it could be waiting for a very long time for that data to come through. Um, basically, the limitations are the number of jumps it makes through the network, not really so much uh, the hardware side of things, because hardware is usually pretty fast. Um, the actual data being sent through the network, we have it software limited right now to every half second. Um, and for the most part, that is limited by the software itself, depending on how efficient our code is and how efficient the algorithms are that we're running. Um, but just for testing purposes right now, we limited to half a second between updates on the network. Any more questions? Any more questions? If not, uh, so I'm, for the last time, I'm going to request everyone in the audience to please use the link that I've just posted to go to Survey Monkey and then uh, put in your evaluations. Uh, we'll, you know, give everyone two or three minutes for that, and then we'll come back and wrap it up. <clears throat> Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys. It was a very good project.
All right, so I hope everyone had the chance to put in their evaluations. So we've come to the end of uh, our subgroups presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for their patience, for their participation, for putting in your evaluations. Like I mentioned, all of our students have done a great job and you know, we really appreciate your uh, you know, participation. <clears throat> so if we were in the real classroom, you know, we'd get to upload them in person. So I guess, you know, before we go, I guess we can do a round of applause for all our students because they've done a great job that they've all put in their efforts. So. <clears throat> I'm on a meeting, can we? <laughs> so if there's no other questions, I'm going to uh, end the meeting. And uh, just to let everyone know, if you use the same link, there's one more EE presentation that's going to be starting at 4.30 because we had uh, 11 groups. So we we had to split it in five and six groups. So our, this uh, subgroup had five teams. The one in the, that's on the room 210, 210, it has one more project starting at 4.30. So, um, you know, <clears throat> you can join that link as well. So with that being said, um, thanks everyone. Uh, say that again, please. Oh, I just got the news that the, the other group are actually finished. So I'm sorry for the uh, uh, misinformation. So it looks like they started and they were running ahead of schedule. So they are also finished. So, um, so that's it, I guess, for this year. Uh, we really appreciate everyone who attended. Uh, congratulations to all the students for a great job. And hopefully we'll see everyone next year, hopefully in person in the, in the new building. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Pleasure as always. Yeah, good to watch these presentations. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, thank you. Great job for everyone. <laughs>